Rag Radio. This is KOOP Hornsby, Austin. I'm Thorn Dreyer, and this is RAG Radio, where you're driving in the left lane. Peruvian social psychologist Cristina Herencia works in interdisciplinary social sciences with a specialty in the study of indigenous peoples. Uh, she's been teaching introductory sociology at Austin Community College, has a master's in experimental psychology from the State University of New York, and a PhD in Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Christina's primary research deals with social identity in native Andean uh, peoples and cultures, uh, especially in relation to gender and the impact of globalization on their lives. She's, uh, she's given talks and, give, and papers all over the world, uh, all over South America, Latin America, Paris, Spain, Havana, Cuba. She attended the 1992 Columbus uh, Ken Centennial commemoration and for the last nine years has participated in United Nations forums on indigenous persons. Uh, Christina, welcome to RAG Radio. It's so great to come to your program, Thorn. It's so special to have a program like yours that does social and political commentaries. You have no idea how important they are for people like me to guide and orient ourselves in life in the United States internationally because we have to connect politically all over the world. And so um, I feel very privileged to be part of your program. Well, we're very privileged to have you as part of our program. <laughs> so how very cool. Uh, I, I love what you've done. I've, I've been following you for a while. You've been on the air here <clears throat> at the station uh, previously, uh, back when I was an apprentice on uh, <laughs> Alan Campbell's People's, People United. Tell us a little bit about your background and how this became such a, you know, how you decided to basically devote your life studies, or at least at this point, your life work to this yes. issue. Yes, yeah. Well, um, as we were visiting before, I told you that uh, my interest in indigenous people's uh, studies and indigenous people's life uh, began uh, almost from the moment that I was born. Um, uh, uh, my father was a lawyer, and he was a judge, and he happened to fail in favor of indigenous communities holding on to the rightly held communal land in a time when landlords and the oligarchy of Peru controlled, and the law was in the service of oligarchs in Peru. And that cost him his life. And I was very young, and ever since then, my life was marked. I remember your first, uh, our first conversation as, you know, are you indigenous? No, I was not born in a community. And my native language is not Quechua. My native language is Spanish. My father was mixed blood, but he didn't speak Quechua. And my mother was Spanish speaking. She spoke Quechua by necessity because her people, uh, all the stock settlers in the uh, internal provinces of South Peru, um, they had come uh, almost as company of uh, Pizarro and in search of gold mines, but they were, uh, they were not indigenous, but they had to use, they were using the labor of indigenous communities and living with them. So she spoke Quechua, but very early in my life, I was, when the language was available to me, I was taught, I was led to learn English instead of the native language. But I think the, the, the sacrifice of my father uh, marked my life very early on, and I knew that his work needed to be pursued. And with time in, in, in his laws, uh, I was much more thrown into indigenous communities' arms and, uh, or indigenous people's arms from whom I learned very much. And at the end, it, you know, it's been through time that my identity has been, uh, my stand in life has been set. And in a country that is as divided as Peru between, you know, um, dominant group, which is criollo mestizo, Western based or adhered, and the majority of indigenous peoples, then uh, if you're mestizo like me, you know, the only, the 
the only way or the most probable way to, to make it in the system is to adhere to Western education and to become one of the group that is non-Indian, opposed to the Indian, and really invested in, in the gradual disappearance of the, the, the people, of the culture, culture, the language. Yeah. Yeah. And because of my, my biographical uh, situation, uh, very early on, from early adolescence, I knew where I was going. And, um, and so uh, that has been part of my life trajectory. So I'm, I, I, I was part of the Indian movement from, um, from when I was 27 years old, which is, I was part of the groups that founded the first groups, the first meetings of indigenous peoples in the Andes. And I was very fortunate also to have the guidance of wonderful Amautas, elders, who really answer my questions and encourage and, um, and, and, and taught many things. Then you turn to elders in academia. Uh, what, what, did you go into did, to studying psychology, sociology, whatever, as, as a result? I mean, looking to, towards that end of helping and, and studying and le learning about and helping indigenous You know, I was very movement. young, and I was very puzzled about the suffering of indigenous peoples. I remember being about you know, 15 or 14 years old, and one day saying, I just want to explain why is it that indigenous people suffer so much. And, and then I decided at that point that I would study psychology first, and then I would study sociology to see what society did. Or I was trying to find the answers. And I think all of my life has been a trajectory of finding the answers. I did like uh, first degree in, in psychology and, and then experimental psychology as a way to do research in social psychology. And all of my degrees, my academic degrees, were earned here in the United States with scholarships. Um, and, but at that point, the discipline of psychology, especially in the United States, it's, it's marked towards uh, individualism and, and, and psychology is very much an asocial, acultural, and ahistorical discipline. So for my interest, it wasn't enough. So uh, the, it couldn't incorporate the issues that concern me. Then I went to sociology, and sociology is very much an urban-based uh, 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 study of society. You know, it studies the problems that were brought up by capitalism and industrialization. And of course, that is partly the case of contemporary Peru. But of course, it is not all of it. There was still the subject matter that occupies the, uh, uh, anthropology, which is the study of peoples that are different from the West, the other, the savages, the indigenous peoples, looking out from, from the colonizers to the colonized, which studied uh, Andean culture for a long time. And then there is the temporal perspective on that is what happened in history. So my trajectory in the studies have covered all of these areas to get to some answers. And, um, and, and that's where I am. And uh, it's, it's been like uh, a walk in the desert. Four years, Moses talk, walking in circles around the desert, that's the way I feel as an, as an academic woman, uh, searching for answers on indigenous issues. And the last step of the way, of course, is stopping and observing uh, the dealings of indigenous peoples with governments, UN officials, and financial institutions in the last nine years at the United Nations. Okay, uh, history, as they say, is written by conquerors. You know, history is, is documented by colonizers, uh, and it's defined to a great extent by that, by those movements. And, and uh, never more uh, now than in the past, especially with globalization. I mean, it's a different kind of colonization, or it's a different kind of... Uh, and the, the indigenous peoples, and indigenous peoples represent what? 
400,000, 400 million, 600 million, a, a lot of people. Well, the uh, official, it, yeah, the official statistics that the United Nations has is from 300 to 400 million people. But these are based on official statistics that the states and institutions gather. And many of those, much of those statistics are biased because of inaccessibility of indigenous peoples who are located in the rims of society, very backward places in forests or, or lakes or like uh, in the tundras, uh, you know, very, or deserts. Or also the fact that uh, there is a, a historical issue that indigenous peoples, because of the imposition of dominant cultures over them have been forced to incorporate themselves into urban centers. So when you do censuses, for instance, in most of Latin America, you have categories of marking like, uh, what are you? Are you white, mestizo, or are you Indian or black or whatever? Most people center into mestizo because it carries less uh, uh, discrimination connotations. So, uh, but many of those people are migrant Indians to the, to the city. So the count of 400 million, 300, 400 million, we believe it's, it's, it's a little uh, uh, underestimation of, of the real population of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in, 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 of the world. And in, in I know, like for instance, Guatemala is, is, has a majority of indigenous people in this population, I believe. What, what about Peru? How, how, how much is that culture well, remain? Uh, how many? You know, one, one appreciation is uh, Peru has about 35% mono, monolingual uh, native speakers of the language, 35% of the population, 30% of the population. If you increase bilingual, use many of indigenous peoples are bilingual, you could get at about 55% of the population. But, and there's indigenous peoples who already lost the language, but there are still indigenous peoples. And, and, and you know, there's a question of definition what makes an indigenous person also. What, is, what does what, make it, what, what, what is an indigenous person? What it, are we talking about? Well, you know, what the United Nations defines, the way that the United Nations defines the indigenous peoples is peoples that inhabited an area of the world from times immemorial. And they were adapted to their environment and they used their environment for survival until newcomers came and took over their territory and marginalized, oppressed them, and pushed them aside. And uh, so indigenous peoples, uh, are, exist all over the world. But of course, the experience of the Americas is very, um, almost archetypal on what uh, the condition of indigenous peoples all over the world is. Because it is the single-handedly, the only continent as a whole that was highly populated at the time of European arrival. And somehow Europeans created the myth that this was an empty continent, that it was land all over the place and there was no people. And for me as a social psychologist, it's always a puzzle. How could we, how do mechanisms of self-interest blind our vision so as to deny the existence of the people? You know, we see what we need to, we want to see. And collectively we have armed this myth that the continent was totally empty, and there were a few savages here, and, and they were vicious or ferocious, and then you just needed to take over because this was a gift for the newcomers of the West that were coming desperate to settle the continent. Yeah, so no. um, the, the issue is that, the, issue is that the, the question of the American Indians is, uh, it makes us understand the situation of indigenous peoples all over the world, I think. Well, that's, uh, there are several issues that you've raised. What, what, as long as you bring up the American, I mean, probably of all of the, the indigenous or native cultures in, in, in the Americas, the, the, the American Indians have been wiped out the most, the culture has been wiped out the most, uh, to some extent assimilated, but mostly just destroyed, decimated. Uh, to what extent is this not true in, in other parts of Latin America? To what extent does, do the, where do the cultures, the, the indigenous cultures really still exist in, in, in very basic? Uh, well, the, the levels of destruction, physical and psychological destruction, vary in different commu indigenous communities of the Americas. And now I'm going to talk as a paradigm sort of to explain the indigenous uh, peoples of the whole world uh, on the basis of the model of the Americas. So 
I think there is a time, there, this is the moment to start studying uh, indigenous peoples of the continent who were denied as a whole the existence as a human race, uh, and then I'll explain that in a minute, uh, in different levels of destruction, physical, cultural, and psychological destruction. And of course, what you say about North American Indians, uh, the, the native peoples of the Americas north of the Rio Grande was one of the most complete eliminations of population, uh, physical, psychological, and cultural. It, however, you know, despite the fact that they are still the smallest minority in the population of the United States, they are about five to six million people, the smallest uh, uh, racial and cultural minority in the United States, there are still uh, courageous and heroic resistors who keep very clearly different values and different uh, perception and waiting for a renaissance, a renaissance that will come when uh, white people or, or the dominant cultures that, that occupy their territories would realize uh, the extent of the historical uh, the historical mistake or the historical um, injustice that, that, that took place unto them. But uh, in, the, in South America, uh, um, well, it's not that they were not physically eliminated, that they, but they were able to reproduce in greater numbers, keeping, keeping uh, cultures and societies, and, and of course, the, the, the sense of social and political organization, which what is important is qualitatively different from the West. And that's what uh, it would be very important for me to reiterate in this, in this conversation with you. What indigenous peoples of the world present right now is not just that, of course, they're being, uh, as never before in the past, being uh, aggressed upon voraciously or ferociously, uh, we are not just victims, but indigenous peoples are offering an alternative of social and political organization. And I think it is by the means of globalization and the, the communication means that globalization has that indigenous peoples finally can speak out clearly their voice to the global world. Okay, we have to take a break. Uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer, this is RAG Radio, and we're talking with uh, Christina Herencia. We'll be right back. We're talking about indigenous peoples of the world. We're talking about the impact of globalization uh, on those peoples and also the uh, sort of reemergence of indigenous peoples as a force in the world. So, uh, Christina, um, what, I mean, the, the way that those, that the aggression against against those cultures. It's, it's a little different than it used to be. Uh, but what role has that, as globalization, has the kind of world uh, community, what, what role has that played, uh, the, the expansion of capitalism in new kind of ways? What role has that played? Well, in I don't know if you recall, uh, Thorne, that the first time that we met here at Co-op, uh, I almost jumped on the program of Alan Campbell and asked him, please let me participate in your program. And that was about three years ago, and there was, uh, a, at that point, there was a big problem in the, in the Peruvian Amazon basin, where indigenous peoples had been, uh, had been protesting for the, the, the opening of the Peruvian government of the whole Peruvian jungle to explorations by oil and gas corporations. And indigenous peoples who first opened the door to, to the investment and education and roads and, and health services in their communities, they realized after a few years, and this is 40 years of explorations, which have, been, which have decimated the Peruvian Amazon basin. And the indigenous peoples were protesting, and the government of Alan Garcia sent the army and killed very many of them. I had just come from New York, and I asked Alan, please let me talk about this, because this is relevant. And what I, what I uh, said at that point is that, what I realized is that the 500 years of domination of Western culture, in most of it colonial by uh, Spanish people, uh, could be compared to 40 years of compressed presence of corporations and in the level of destruction that they did. That is what 
corporations did in 40 years equals to 500 years of destruction. And, and what happens is that the intensity of the destruction is so great. Can you imagine 85,000 barrels of contaminated water with mercurium, cadmium, and lead every single day thrown into the purest rivers of the Amazon basin where some of these uh, tribes of, of indigenous peoples in the, in, the, in the Amazon area live. So uh, the destruction is enormous, but at the it, same time- It's not only enormous to, to, to the native peoples, it's also because of the role that the rainforest plays in the world ecology, it's the destruction is for, is for yeah. all of us. And, and I remember yeah. at that point, I, I just, uh, I, I, you know, I, I got a little uptight and I said, come on, you guys, you know, it is the cars that you drive and as the, the insatiable need of, 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 um, of energy, of oil and gas and all of that, that, that it's being used in the north that is destroying the, 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 most, the purest natural reserves and the people that have nothing to do with this crazy uh, contamination and overuse of resources. Right. And, and so it, it, it is, uh, at that point, uh, I was uh, talking about this emergency issue, uh, but I think what, what I would like to talk now more than the emergency and how much and how badly they're impacted, because they are, it's to reflect about what they bring to the political arena internationally. And that is, I think, that is the most meaningful thing. Okay, well, yeah, we definitely, that's mm -hmm. definitely on our <laughs> agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but first, while we're talking about that, before, to what extent have the movements against those actions, especially in, the, in, 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 in uh, Peru and in, in the Amazon, to what extent have they, had, have they been successful? To what extent has they at least affected public opinion? Um, Apparently, no, not very not, much not impact. Much, huh? Not by, uh, despite the, the fact that that is so crucial. What is amazing is like when you talk to ordinary people that are you know a little bit more educated than the average, because the average level of information um, uh, uh, here in the U.S. is is basic, I think. Uh, but um, but if you talk even to educated people. What they are aware of is that, uh, oh, what happened to Native Americans was horrible. For instance, the killing of the buffalo by masses, or the cutting of the forest in the Northeast, or to, distract, to destroy 95% of the primeval forests that North America had in the 1600s, to just throw the wood in the rivers and, and destroy everything. That was criminal, that was bad, that would never happen. And then my, my concern is, listen, that happened like two centuries ago or a, ha a century and a half ago, or here in the United States, it is taking place right now in other places of the world. And that despite the fact that you have the most sophisticated means of world communication and you're not aware of. But it's, it is time to correct your vision. What is, it is taking place to the other still and replicating the same, the same scheme, the same pattern of action with peoples that are non, Privileged that are none in the metropolitan areas of power in the world. Okay, uh, things maybe have started to turn in some ways, and and I think maybe one of the first things that happened was uh, was uh, it came with Evo Morales in Bolivia. Uh, what well, role did, did he play? Well, in the issue is that there are people that are studying the political situation, the political and historical situation in the countries very much, and I'm 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 pretty sure that parallel to what is produced in the universities, there is other ways of, of studying uh, political happenings. And, and it is known that in Latin America, where you have a, a majority of mestizo and still a, a very strong uh, percentage of, of indigenous peoples, observers from outside know that if you want to keep liberal democracies in place, then it is just too scandalous, like it was in Bolivia, which is 65% or 68% indigenous, to have absolutely no indigenous representation. So if you are democratic and there is representation by the people that live in a country, you have to have some representation of the real people that live in the area. So Evo Morales is the result of that, not only uh, as a push from the 
popular sectors from indigenous peoples, from the population uh, of, of Collasuyo itself. Collasuyo is the Indian name of Bolivia, but also from spheres that overlook how things are marching in the world politically. So it's it's an allowance, it's it's a letting off that that kind of model. What is important though that Evo Morales, even though he was the first native uh, uh, native Andean or native peoples uh, president at the United Nations, he is he doesn't represent all of that. There is a whole movement behind him that uh, sets and is concerned about the direction and the kind of society that they want to uh, to create. It could be with Evo Morales, it could be with somebody else, but it is a collective uh, leadership and consciousness that is coming to the fore that is very different from uh, from ordinary and conventional times. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we're, let's talk now about how international awareness and action has has begun, especially through the United Nations. And, and, and the, I, a lot of us feel, I guess, what we see, we don't see so much of the stuff that the UN does. We see that maybe what seems like... An, Security Council yeah, stuff. Yeah, and, and we don't see much and effectiveness, and we see that, the, you know, that... Uh, tell me what role the UN has played in, in bringing, uh, bringing this to awareness and be giving a voice to the indigenous movement. Well, you know, um, because of my early uh, adhesion to the movement, um, I was very fortunate to be friends of leaders of the movement, uh, intellectual leaders and active leaders of the movement in the Andean area. And I have the personal recount of some very uh, important people that were among the, the, the initiators of the opening the doors of the United Nations in contemporary times. That was especially uh, like around the uh, late 70s, you know, mid 70s to early early 80s. Um, and of course, there is uh, a lot of background to that. In the 1930s, Native American uh, leaders had gone to the UN and, and and, and ask for participation because they were sovereign nations recognized by law and still didn't have any 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 role as nations. And they were sent back and the United Nations was close to them. But uh, in the in this uh, from the 70s to the 80s, and there's a group of people that converged uh, from the Andes, from North America, and from other areas, and went again to the United Nations. One of the one of the trigger facts was that what was going on in Guatemala. There was in the in the early 80s there was a genocide of Native peoples of Guatemala by President Rios Montt, and and then uh, when that was happening, uh, and they said, well, who are we going to complain? Uh, the United Nations has to hear our our case, and at that point. The UN, which also we have to keep in mind, UN officials are a very select elite group from all, all from every country in the world. Not, ordinary people are not officers of, of the UN, and most of the extraordinariness is based on class, is not based on necessarily talent or human dimension. So many of these people just uh, closed the doors to indigenous peoples and said, go to your governments and protest. And they said, well, they're killing us. How are we going to talk through them? So it was two scandals. They, uh, these indigenous peoples, after several rebuttals and being sent back, they got friends internally and they said, you have to help us because we are peoples that live in nation states who do not have any political representation. And if we don't have political representation in our countries, we don't have it internationally too. And, and if we're thinking about, you know, just in terms of human race, uh, races, up to the 1980s, the United Nations had all races, human races, represented in one way or the other as government representatives or as officers. And, you know, the black race, the yellow race, the Caucasian, uh, Arabs, it's only native peoples of the Americas. And I'm using this as a paradigmatic, uh, you know, a mm -hmm. example. The red race was the only human race that was totally excluded with absolute no representation at the highest level of, of convergency of, of, of leaders, political leaders, 
uh, for, the whole, for the whole world. So it was at that point that people, uh, these leaders, uh, Andean and, and other Central American and, and North American leaders got together. And, but it was very interesting, it was 1992, the commemoration of the Quincentennial That's of Columbus, was that was really the- Tell us what that was. Pandora's box. Well, it was, it's, um, you know, the, the f 1992 was 500 years of the supposed discovery of the Americas. And of course, it was the first time that there, there was- There were people who had already discovered it before that, the people who lived in the Americas. <laughs> yeah, not, go ahead. Yes, not, not only that, I yeah. mean, if you, you right. hear that the Chinese uh, going around right. the world like 100 years before right. and visiting right. all of the continents and not ever thinking of conquering. Right. That was even 100 years before that. Right, but if we talk about Columbus, yeah. that's where, yeah. But the issue is that this was the time when already you had uh, indigenous movements in the Americas, and they were able to contest that interpretation of the discovery of the beneficial uh, uh, effects of the European implantation in, uh, in the continent. So, but uh, the United States, I, I think socially and politically always lags before, uh, behind. In Europe and Latin America was much more clear. I actually participated in a, in a research project uh, conducted at the University of Nebraska where I was a sociology student then um, about the, the social representations of the Columbia's Quincentennial in university students. And it was a comparison between 32 countries about how students, university students conceived this encounter between the worlds, between the West and native peoples. It was a beautiful research project. Unfortunately, it wasn't written as a result because it was too large and a little complicated. But what, what was interesting is at that point, it, it was clear that you could not it, you could not justify, for instance, the 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 genocide that has that the encounter, uh, that the uh, that, that the discovery caused in in the Americas, and I think that is a very important fact that could put upside down even the epistemology of how we have social and historical knowledge around in the world right now. For instance, I, I spoke about this in, in a talk uh, several years ago to a wonderful group of veterans of, of war, and I said, uh, one of the news that is very hardly discussed is how many people were killed in the continent uh, after the conquest, and just taking like 150 years. And it was the most modest estimate is about 75 million people that were killed in 150 years. When I said to a leader of the Indian movement, a very, very uh, intelligent, well, brilliant guy in Peru, and I said, I can't believe that in such a short period, three generations, they killed 75 million people. And then he says, why should you, should you be surprised? You know, at that point, Europeans were 8% of the population of the world, and they managed to kill 50% of the population of the world. The population of the world was 500 million, 400 million people, and in 150 years of the discovery, you know, the conquest that all of the European countries went crazy to raid the world, they managed to kill 200 million people. So, Really, if you take this into account, you're looking back to history to see a total re revision of history. The first world war was not really in the 1917 or the, the beginning of the 20th century. The first global war occurred at that time. And the, 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 the Columbus discovery of the Americas was the beginning of, of that. So what do indigenous peoples bring to the to the fore right now in global times is saying, guys, we, we, were, we were not born poor. We were made poor with colonization. Colonization, as you know, is, is, is derives from the name of Colon, Cristobal Colon. We were made poor through centuries, and the process has, has lasted all of this, and we have gone through actual political colonization, and then 
neo-colonialism in the third world, which means, means the divide between the, the first and third world, but where indigenous peoples, even in the third world, constitute a separate constituency, a separate population, which has keeps values and worldview uh, as, as it was before, and very often refuse to integrate into the kind of life that modernity presents. We're going to talk about more about what's happening in the world today with globalization and the effect it has. And I think the most important thing uh, is what uh, indigenous people have to bring to the table. Uh, and what, that's kind of, that's our finale. So uh, we'll be right back. Two things I want to talk about now in our last segment here. One is, I think you referred when you and I were talking to the vora voracious appetite of uh, global capitalism. Uh, and there are so many forces in motion that what hope do we have to, to counter that? What do you see as the, in the larger picture is happening in the world? Do you see that the that indigenous movements have are gaining strength anywhere? Uh, are they gaining more political power? Uh, are, is it, what are the hopes and what can people do? Well, I think what is really, really important is uh, sometimes when you have indigenous peoples voicing their concerns and you have governments and, and, and UN officials sort of listening and, and bureaucratically sort of processing what the, and at the end, uh, uh, you know, how much can governments do and how much can UN offices do also. What indigenous people say, well, uh, uh, it's not so much the effect and the efficiency of the responses that we get from this body, it is how much we can meet with each other. And, and so a lot of the beneficial, uh, the benefits of having indigenous peoples from all over the world is that indigenous peoples for the first time, these 400 to 500 million people, have people that share experiences. And we realize, for instance, that Sami Indians in, in North Europe who are blonde and blue eyes and, and they live in, in the most developed and advanced liberal democracies in Europe, in Norway, Sweden, you know, Denmark, and, and even Russia, uh, these people have very much been, substantially most of, of their life in common with Andean Indians or indigenous peoples from Africa or indigenous peoples from Japan or indigenous peoples from Thailand or something. Because what is very important, I think, and as a model of, 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 of socioeconomic organization, and this is very crucial, uh, Thorne, is indigenous peoples do not believe in private ownership of, of resources. Resources are communally shared and they are to be beneficial for everybody in the community. Second, there is an, uh, a relationship of human beings with nature that is of dependence. Many indigenous peoples call themselves directly children of the earth, like Mapuche Indians in Chile. They are really, Mapu is, is, uh, is uh, earth and Che is people. We are children of the earth. And if we are children of the earth, our mother, we have to take care of her. And if we are children of the earth, all living things are relatives. And it's beautiful, for instance, the versions that you have from North American Indians talking about sibling nations of plants and animals with whom you can be in harmonic relation to keep this world going. That is another second very important trait of indigenous issues. Indigenous peoples all over the world, Sami in Africa or Andean Indian or Aztecs, we all share that. And the third thing is the centrality and this is also very important, the centrality of mother authority in the culture. There are non-patriarchal, basically non-patriarchal cultures where women have not been undressed of their humanity and their power to decide on social and political issues. And if you have all of this, then you have a different rationale, a different logic to address social economic organization, how to produce and how to distribute goods, because mothers are central 
in social organization. Well, and these, I mean, as we look at what's happened to our, to our, the world culture and to our society, these are the things we lack. These are the things that Western society, that, that we desperately need. Uh, these are the qualities, and that's why when I said earlier, what can indigenous people bring to the table, basic to the, this is. This is the good sure. news. This is the good news for, for a decadent culture uh, because, you know, I've, li I've been living in the United States for a long time and I've seen the deterioration of life conditions and, and, and the ever increasing uh, number of poor people that really breaks my heart. But this is the good news that indigenous peoples bring, that it's, it's a new culture. And the fourth trait that is really, really important is the avoidance of, uh, of, of aggression and, and attack as a way to solve problems. So there are peaceful, massive movements that, that, that really require a huge movement. And I think we have a few minutes and I would like to, uh, I would like to close with one thing. Uh, part of the organized movements in the Andes present the best news that I see coming politically in my part of the world, which I think would say a lot to the world. It's the concept of sumach causai, sumach causai, or alin causai, which in Quechua means we, the good life, the optimum life. What indigenous peoples are bringing to the government is saying, we want, we don't want what the West has. We don't want development. We want sumach causai, alin causai, which was our philosophy before Europeans arrived. And what is that? The optimum life means a life that does not depend on the oppression and the, and the suffering of other human beings or any living thing. So we want to keep an equilibrium, a balance that would keep everybody good and, and everybody satisfied. That is the life that we choose to have and we want to work to, in a social organization that keeps that equilibrium, that balance, that uh, harmony of forces, natural and human forces. And so the answer is to retain those values, not to be assimilated into exactly. Western culture. Okay, Christina Herencia, thank you so much for being with us. This has been, uh, this has been an enlightening hour. Thank you very much, uh, Thorne, and I am giving thanks especially to the Native peoples, inhabitants of this beautiful city, Austin, Texas, and which the Native peoples which are now, who are now nameless, and maybe they survived, maybe they didn't, but they, they roamed around these beautiful hills and these beautiful uh, water springs. So honor to them, and I hope the good news of indigenous peoples gets to all of the people that are searching for hope in the new, new days of globalization. And we're happy to be able to help spread that good news. Thank so, you so thank much, you, Thorne. Christina. Thank you. Okay, I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is RAG Radio. Uh, we've been with you for the last hour, and we'll be back with you next Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. on KOOP, Hornsby, Austin.